it's so important to re recognize that early on when we are getting to know someone new, we are riding those hormone cocktails and chemicals, all those happy chemicals. We don't really even get to see a person's attachment patterns in relationship until we get to the more committed next phase of romantic love. Welcome to Men This Way. What's up, Tate and Sylvie? Welcome to Men This Way. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be chatting with you, menzies. Tate, we, we have had lots of conversations, Sylvie, but this is the first recorded one. And I am so excited to have this conversation with you. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is a big deal. It's very exciting. You're, you're our first guest, Sylvie, uh, with Tate and I co-hosting. And um, anyway, thank you for saying yes to this, for being here with us. Oh, I didn't know that I was your first guest with the two of you. So that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. This is, a, this, is a, this is a whole new format and adventure for us. And, you know, just so, you know, our listeners know too. Yep. Sylvie is my wife and uh, Tate has long time listeners will know is my best, my childhood best friend of 40 years. So the two people that we are in conversation with right now are the two, some of the two of the most important people in my life for decades. And so uh, I'm feeling nervous. I'm feeling excited, feeling grateful. And um, just, it's a, it's an honor to be here, but with you both. So this is exciting. Yay. I'm, so I'm... One, of, one of the things I, I I've been thinking a lot about, um, and I'm not ever sure that I've, I've said this to you, but I, I just want you to know for me, what a shining light you are to this world and to my world. You are, have such a beautiful spirit and you are warm and compassionate and empathetic. And you, you have just gifted my life and my family's life with who you are and i just wanted to publicly thank you but just really let you know i cannot thank you enough for who you are in my life and my family's life and my best friend's life and you are you know you've been lighting a candle in the world and and providing just so many incredible insights and gifts and i just want you to know what what a what a light you are to me in this world no you got me crying before we even started thank you that's so sweet and kind and i'm i'm so grateful and the, all of the feelings are so mutual tate and i mean how lucky that we get to be connected now through brian and to build this beautiful relationship with you and your family and i'm just i'm so so grateful truly thank you for those words yeah, I've been, I've been, it's a, it's really a good thing when, when your friends and family embrace your intimate partner. I know I've had the opposite experience in the past and I know some of our listeners will have experienced that as well. Um, well, you know, the fact, I mean, we could just sit here gushing all over you, Sylvie, for this whole episode as oh, temp tempting <laughs> and you're easy, you're easy to, to do that with. Um, but let, let's. Let's actually dive into the conversation that we're here to explore today because your your what you've been working with for the last you know number of years has been one of one of the expertise is you've really grounded and deepened in is is attachment styles in intimate relationships. And so uh, just to help our listeners get to know you better, I mean Tate and I know you great, help our listeners who may not be familiar with you in your work get to know you a bit better. Let, let's just start by asking you, what, what inspired you to delve into the world of attachment styles and relationships? Absolutely. So my introduction to attachment work began when I was uh, receiving my master's program for psychology, marriage, and family therapy. And essentially, we were given so many different theories and modalities in which we can work with clients um, 
in our in our work. And when I stumbled upon attachment theory, I resonated so much with this particular theory because all the light bulbs started going off, you know, and attachment theory is essentially, um, it was a theory by John Bowlby that was developed in the 1960s and Mary Ainsworth um, also came in and pioneered a lot of the work in there. And it's essentially the way that we our, we the way that we related to our caregivers and the way that our caregivers responded to us as children was mirrored in our adult relationships. So being able to recognize that patterning in our early childhood years and the way that it showed up in adult in adulthood just blew my mind. So many pieces of the puzzle for my own personal journey started to connect. Some of my struggles with dating and why I wasn't able to partner up started to connect, even though I was so deeply wanting to be in romantic relationship, um, it really just started to make sense. So, you know, I'll share more about the theory and this different attachment styles, but really the the clicking happened for me in my grad school experience. Hmm. And, and, and while you were in that degree and you came across this, was it, was it an immediate light bulb for you given, you know, the life experience that you had given your dating things or, or you know, it seems very accessible. Attachment theory seems very accessible, but there's a lot of depth to it. So at what point in time did it become like a light bulb for you that this, there was something really profound here? Well, I did my uh, grad school paper. So we all choose a specific paper that we write on our research paper. And that's where I got to really dug deep. And I could share a little bit more about, you know, what the different attachment styles are. I think it'll help connect some of the dots as well. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, when you find a map that makes sense for the life experience that you have, it just validates your experiences, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. you know, in my dating journey, uh, like I like I shared, I, I, I was going on so many dates. I was having these connections with men and I was struggling so much to move past that into a committed phase in relationship. And when I understood, you know, those connections, um, it just, it made, it, it, again, it made sense and... I started to make changes in my own life as a result. And that's when I was like, I need to, I need to teach this. I need to, you know, really go deep in the research and um, show people how they can better understand themselves so they can create incredibly fulfilling relationships. So that was the, that was the core for me is that that information allowed me to change how I related to, to partners and eventually, which is what allowed me to pair bond with my husband, Brian Reeves, which is right here. And so bring us into that paper. Give us give us an overview of the different attachment styles and and just just how they interact uh, inside of relationship. This is the this is the juicy part. Yes. So you're thinking about uh, a, a baby that's a few years old. Generally, birth to three years old is when the attachment uh, patterning develops. And how a primary caregiver, so generally it's the mother, but it's not always the mother. It's the person responsible for attending to the emotional needs and soothing the child and attuning, being present and available and responsive. And when a child has that experience with their caregiver, the majority of the time, they develop more secure attachment tendencies. And I use the word tendencies a lot in my work because I really like to soften the black and whiteness of the attachment map. It's so easy for us to, you know, start using the languaging and just be like, she's avoidant, he's anxious. And I just don't ever find that helpful. So when we have that, you know, attuned experience and that presence and respon the responsiveness a significant amount of the time, we develop more secure attachment patterns. When we have a caregiver that is they're some of the time really attuned, really present, and other times they're not there. And there's this really big gap happening that can create an, an anxious attachment pattern. The child doesn't know, is my you know caregiver going to be there for me? Are they not going to be there for me? And this is happening on you know such an unconscious primal level that there's no language that's developed for a child. So it's all getting stored into the unconscious. And um, so when that child develops anxious tendencies, they can grow up to feel really afraid of abandonment in relationship. They can feel afraid of physical or emotional abandonment. And when they sense that coming on, they can start, their, their attachment system gets activated 
and they'll do whatever it takes to reconnect with the person they are in relationship with. And sometimes it can be unhelpful. They're not direct about what's going on. They can be very punishing, very passive aggressive, uh, very angry. And uh, somebody with more avoidant tendencies grew up with a caregiver that was not emotionally attuned most of the time. So this is like a family system that was very focused on doing tasks, accomplishments, achievements, but there wasn't emotional depth. Nobody was engaging with the children or getting really curious about what was going on in their world. Um, and just that they were kind of left hanging a lot in the emotional realm. So this child grows up to be an adult, according to the theory, um, who is very self-sufficient. They learn to auto-regulate their own nervous system. And even though they want to be in relationship, they really struggle because when they get close to someone, it brings up all of that um, attachment anxiety of that they don't have the ability to um, feel comfort in because they never experienced that. Well, I imagine you said something, Sylvie, also that that in this in this of the avoidance side of things, <clears throat> that the family of origin can be very achievement oriented, outcome oriented, uh, uh, accomplishment oriented, and and I'm 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 wondering also though can that family system even if maybe those things aren't present, but there's just a like a, a lot of people we work with a lot of men that felt like women too, a lot of women too, that, that felt like they had to grow up at a young age, right? They had to, in a way, become an adult very young to step into responsibility to, because maybe a parent left or the parents in some way had abdicated their responsibilities or just left the, the you know, kids alone to fend for themselves kind of thing. Does that also lend itself to a, a, a more avoidant style? Like is Absolutely. Yeah. So if a child is, you know, a child is supposed to be a child and if they're given, um, you know, responsibilities that are not appropriate for their developmental stage, they are, their nervous system is going to become overwhelmed. And so they are not going to feel like relationship is a nourishing place for me. Right. So we, we co-regulate with adults, with our caregivers, and that's how we learn to self-regulate. So if we don't have that experience and we're kind of having to be the adult uh, figure in a, in a, in a you know, family system at early age, absolutely, we're going to associate the feeling of, you know, this is something that comes up a lot with my more avoiding clients, um, is the feeling of being used. I feel like when I get close to someone, they're going to want something for me. So I got to pull back. I got to protect myself, right? And so it's really hardwired in. And then the fourth attachment style, which came on a little bit later, which has some of that as well, is the fearful avoidant attachment. It came, it came around um, more recently. And that is a child that grows up in a very fear-based home. So they might have one parent that's really loving and present and another that's extremely intense, or maybe there was violence or abuse happening in the home. Um, this can also happen when parents have a lot of unresolved traumas in their own experiences that they've never really worked through. This can happen through, you know, immigrant families. This is something that my family system, you know, experienced a lot of. And children can, you know, they want to go to their caregivers because there is a sense of closeness and love, but they can also feel fear and um, confusion there. So these people grow up to be uh, adults in relationships where they really want relationship because they have the template for it oftentimes, but they they get very overwhelmed, they get very confused, and there's this like push-pull experience. And this is what I, you know, Brian went through in the beginning of our relationship. I was like, wait a minute, I feel so connected, but every time we would get into a fight, I would have my bag, my, 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 what's, I don't try to think of it, like my bag ready to go. It's your metaphorical and bag. My metaphorical bag, my, my luggage was always packed in my mind, you know, yeah. Sylvie, how, how, you know, you've just given some really beautiful descriptions, but how, if somebody's listening to this and they're still kind of trying to discern w which style they have the tendency towards, how, what's the best way for a listener to really understand what their attachment style is? That's a great question. And I get a lot of people that reach out to me that, you know, are interested in taking a quiz. They want to know like how they can find out. And so there are absolutely quizzes online that people can take that can be a nice roadmap. But I think the the best way to kind of gauge it is how do you feel when you're in relationships with people? So when and and the attachment theory was 
uh, focused on romantic relationships, so intimate romantic partnership. But again, more and more recent re research is showing that um, attachment is very much present in friendships as well. And I have some questions for you towards the end of the podcast that I'm, I really want to dig into your own experiences with that because you guys are such beautiful role models for secure attachment. Um, but if you if you tend to feel like relationships are nourishing for you, you can easily reach out to people when you need support. You can be there for others when they need support. You don't get overwhelmed. Um, it's easier for you to ask, you know, to take your space, but also experience intimacy and connection. That's generally someone that has more secure functioning patterns, secure attachment patterns. With people that have more anxious patterns, you can sense that because you fear people are going to leave you often. Or even in a conversation, somebody might do something and your brain might panic into like, oh my gosh, this person doesn't care about me. They don't love me. A lot of anxious people have that narrative of, um, I'm not lovable. I'm not loved. So the attachment patterns really also affect the way we see ourselves. And then we start to project that on those around us. Um, if, you know, you have a question about that, Brian? Well, I think it's, I think it's interesting to point out too, because as you're, even as you're elucidating those, like, oh my goodness, like my mind, I think back to, you know, 10 years before I met you, Sylvie, you know, in my thirties, if you would have asked me, I would have told you, oh, I'm totally securely attached. That is something that the avoidant tendency loves to say. I got this. I'm securely attached. Come and go as you please. You're fine. You know, I don't, we can. And I'm aware that, uh, you know, when I like, when I then step into relationship, whoa, there's a lot of overwhelm that happens pretty quickly. I'm also aware, even like in when my phone rings, I don't want to pick it up. I don't care who it is. There's a part of me that's like, oh, I can't. You know, what's the, and I think that even that you say that the, that story, I, I'm not good enough. This person, they don't like me. They're not into me. Also lives in this brain for most of my adult life. I had the story that I'm talking to someone. Oh, they don't really care what I have to say. They're, they're, gonna, they're, they're gonna leave me. They're gonna, so it's like, it's not so black and white. Like all of these things can be at play and even at times, like I can show up maybe as, as anxious, like, you know, when you broke up with me four months into our relationship, oh man, did my anxious, what the fuck just happened? Brain came online and where did you go? Come back, right? Ha, ha, what, what, what? You know, the give me, could come back, come back. Now the avoidant, the avoidant part of me was relieved, but that was just an old, you know, the, an old comfort zone not a place that I want to live. So anyway, I just, I just think it's interesting because it's, it, it can be messy. What, what do you say to all that? It's, it's so nuanced. And you know, one of the things that I wanted to make sure I, I addressed early on in this podcast is that this is a theory. It's, it's, it's been researched and studied very intensely. So there's a lot of powerful uh, information that's available to us that we can utilize to create amazing relationships and it's exactly what you said. It's super nuanced, you know, how we relate to one caregiver and we have might have a certain attachment that developed with them, but then we have a very different relationship with another caregiver. And there's also so many other factors that shape our relationship lens, like the, you know, our socioeconomic status, you know, privilege. Um, if we've had a really painful experience in a past relationship where we felt traumatized, that's also going to create anxiety, avoidance. So it's not just about this. This is one map that, you know, gives us some rich information about um, our attachment wiring, but there's definitely a lot of other factors at play. So you were doing such a, a really helpful and delineating the distinction in the first two. Could you finish the, the other two? Yes. So we talked about secure attachment. We talked about anxious. We talked a little bit about avoidant. Um, and then we talk, we were talking about fearful avoidant, which is the, the child that grew up in, um, the chaotic home environment where there was a lot of fear and, um, desire to be close in relationship, but a lot of resistance, that push pull. So these are people that in their adult lives can really struggle to, uh, commit in relationships. Um, and there's one distinction that I also want to talk about is, you know, I work with a lot of clients in their dating journey to help them really clarify the qualities that is going to be a good match for the nervous system. 
And it's so important to re recognize that early on when we are getting to know someone new, we are riding those hormone cocktails and chemicals, all those happy chemicals. We don't really even get to see a person's attachment patterns in relationship until we get to the more committed next phase of romantic love. So that is brilliant. Yeah, it's really right? insightful. Very insightful. So with the fearful attachment, um, this is where people can really struggle to have boundary awareness or they can become really controlling about how they are engaging in their relationships. They can sometimes want to have the power position in a relationship or they can feel helpless. So, um, you know, there's a lot of factors in which the attachment, the attachment map can show up relationally through boundaries, uh, how they show up in conflict, how they, you know, what Brian said is, you know, a lot of people with more avoidant patterns, they're, they've been practiced at being self-reliant. So they oftentimes don't even recognize the value of relationship because they don't know how to relate in a way that's going to be beneficial to them, right? Oh, oh yeah. I, I mean, I, I write about this a lot, this idea of, of relationship is better, as, a relationship as fantasy versus reality. And I think, I think a lot of men in particular, you know, our, our audience tends to be men. We have a lot of women listeners as well, but I think a lot of men experience relationship better as a fantasy than the reality of it. And I know there's a lot of, of reasons. This, this is a complicated and complex subject, but I, but I am curious about, you know, the relationship to perhaps attachment style um, of that phenomenon of, like you said, <clears throat> right. I can, I, cause I went into our relationship just like, oh man, top of the mountain. I made it Woo woman. I waited for, for a long, for a lifetime and we, let's go. And boy, did I quickly start to run into some of my own, you know, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this challenges. When I was, I was looking at the research of, um, before we started today, um, is avoidant attachment more common in men? And a lot of research points to that, more common in men than in women. And I just, I'm skeptical about that research because in addition to the attachment, there's also the tremendous amount of socialization in gender roles and the, the minimization of emotions in men. So there's that other contextual piece. So you can't, you can't look at these concepts in a vacuum. They're being influenced by so many other factors, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I so want to go down the rabbit hole of like uh, talking about how these it, interact with one another in relationship. And I want to get there, but I, this, this family of origin, uh, uh part of the conversation, I, I, I have to go back to that space right. because my, my curiosity is around what role, if any, is necessary to go back and do some healing with, with your primary caregivers or to, to what extent can, can, I don't know, a, a more secure attachment be developed in people that tend to have the other three categories. What has, what should be done? What could be done with that initial caregiver to, to help along that process, uh, for more secure attachment. Do you mean Tate, like with, within the family system or the work that one does on their own? Uh, it could be either. It could be either, right? Because I imagine that if somebody's dealing with relational troubles that they're now starting to clue in could be a, as a result of either their anxious attachment or avoidant attachment or fearful avoidant attachment. I, you know, I start thinking about my mom. I start thinking about my dad. I start thinking about, you know, childhood in different ways. And that can spark different upsets or concerns or just realities of, of that. And, and what, what can and should, if anything, be done about that? Yeah, there's a, there's a new research that came out that in order for a parent to create a caregiver, to create secure attachment with their child, you really only need 30% attunement, 30%, not a lot. What does that, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that we are far more resilient than we realize. And that there's a lot of healing possible when we start to 
make sense of these experiences. So I want to get the 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 research uh, name. We'll put that in the show notes. Important for me, for me to credit the peoples. Um, but what what can happen is that each person can go on their own journey, right? So you can be somebody that has a tremendous amount of secure tendencies, but in certain kinds of relating, you might have a lot of avoidant patterns or you have a lot of anxious patterns. And with different people, you also can experience different ways of being, you know, like with you, with Brian, like my nervous system has the ability to relax because you're so much calmer that a lot of my avoidant tendencies kind of get put to rest. But with other people, I see them showing up so strongly, especially if they have a lot of anxious patterns. I'm like, whoa, 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 like this person, what do they want? For? It's, it's very overwhelming. So I think the first piece is just really being honest with yourself about what you've gone through. And you can't go back in time and be like, all right, what happened at two years old? Let me, you know, do some inventory. We don't have, we don't have that information. And we might even ask our, our parents and they might even not remember the, the, the depths of what we're exploring, but just pay it, paying attention to the way that you're relating now and, and, and noticing the things that you're sensitive to and allowing yourself to grieve the parts that you, the experiences that you didn't get. If you grew up in a home that was not emotionally attuned to you and you were just left hanging to process your own stuff, that's really painful. That's a very lonely experience. So you get the right to recognize the impact of that on you while you also, you know, our parents are flawed and and to remember the the wonderful qualities that they bring, right? Everything is so intergenerational. It goes out the same way that it goes in. So we're repeating these patterns. And when we take that time to really um, gain that self-awareness, we're also changing the intergenerational patterns in the family system, right? You know, it's interesting. I think about that number, that 30%. And I think about, you know, we won't go down this rabbit hole, but I, I don't have a relationship with my father, right? That's not private information. And I think about 30% attunement and just what that would mean. I'm not exactly sure what it me, would mean, but my brain goes, yeah, that'd be great. Just give me, give me, just give me 30% of what, of what, you know, the, the little boy in me would want. And we got something to work with, you know? And it's, it's just fascinating. And it also gives me hope as an, as a parent. Right. To, to really be thinking about my 13 year old daughter, Alexa, my 10 year old son, Tay Jr. To I, I sometimes can really beat myself up about about the level of presence. Uh, I travel a lot for my work and, you know, I, I wonder the impact. But when I really get, oh, 30 well, percent attunement, like, you know, putting them down every night to get and spending quality time and, you know, just like. Oh, I can, it can actually take the pressure off a little bit. And I, I know I've now missed the zero to, as a matter of fact, one of the, one of the greatest regrets that I have of, of, of the first three years of my kids' lives is, is reflecting on how much my phone was present while I was, you know, feeding them a bottle or while I was taking care of them. And so I know that I've missed the zero to three window, but here I am now. And so that, that stat is so helpful for me to know it's not, they don't need a hundred percent of attunement. It's impossible to even give them that in some ways, but what a gift it is just to know, okay, the bar doesn't have to be at a hundred percent and I can lean in from where I'm sitting. And, and, Tate, and Tate, I'm also thinking about, man, all the men that we've worked with, the fathers, the older fathers that we've worked with in the past few years, men are, that are in their sixties and get, well, probably I don't think we've had any seventies. We were getting close, but a lot of fifties and sixties, men who have grown children, who are beginning to heal relationships with those kids by just paying a little bit of attention, just like tuning back in and saying, Hey son, I see you, you know, writing letters. We've had men write letters that they never would have written before. My God, you know, I remember reading some of those letters from guys like, boy, if, boy, if my father would write me a letter like that, oh man, it'd be incredible. So even that, it's like, it's never too late you know, to, to attune, to reattune, if you're a father, a, a parent, a mother for that matter, to, to check back in with your child because it, it's right, you're right. It's like, you don't have to heal the, 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 the wounds of the past. You don't have to go back and relitigate and, and fix what you can't fix. That's what I'm hearing in this is like, just, 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 just start paying a little bit more attention than you did yesterday. You know, check in, call, ask questions. Well, and it's it's like we heal, we hurt in relationships, we heal in relationships, right? So I think the 
the best thing a parent can do is what you guys, what you're doing, Tate, is recognizing the limitations of your parenting while, while also knowing that you're the most amazing dad. I've, Brian, I've seen it and we've been privileged enough to witness that. And to be able to hold space for when the kids come to you and say, you know what, when I was younger, this hurt me or this was challenging for me. And then to attune and to validate their experiences, it's like you're helping to rewire that experience for them, right? And we're so, our brains are so, you know, um, uh, resilient and we we do heal. Like I've been working with a, a therapist for the last 15 years and she's very much like my grandmother figure. And, um, you know, because I didn't grow up with my grandmother or, or my aunts or uncles or any of my extended family members, and I've done a lot of healing around my attachment, but also my mother and I, she is one of the most humble. She brings so much humility. Like I can basically tell her anything about what I struggled with and she will validate the shit out of it. And that doesn't mean that I don't still have some anxiety, some avoidance about what our immigration journey created in my nervous system. But I also look at it through the lens of, holy shit, my parents did so much. They gave up so much. And so as an adult, I can hold my my attachment experience with the wider context that it deserves to be held without invalidating and dismissing my pain and my grief, because I'm very much connected to the emotions that I go through. That's what allows me to be in relationships with people, to be able to be authentic about that. Right? Yeah. Beautiful. Well, so so how do these different attachment styles magnetize towards one another? The most common, and this is what people uh, find to be really fascinating, is the anxious attachment patterning and the avoidant attachment patterning. Love, love, love to find one another. <laughs> love the dance. They love the dance. They love the dance. And it makes sense because they have the they have opposite wounds, and there's there's tremendous opportunity for healing if there's awareness present. So people with more anxious patterning are have a strong right brain development. They that they they tended to have that emotional attunement and um, engagement again, not all the time, but they had it some of the time. So they have more right brain development. People with more avoidant tendencies have more left left brain development, more logical thinking. So there's just a natural draw to people that I think are embodied in the ways that we aren't. So what we have to be careful about is, you know, is this person that I'm in relationship with, you're smiling, Brian, you'll tell us about, you're gonna tell us about what you're thinking. Sure. Um, we have to be careful in that everybody involved in the relationship has to be aware of how they're contributing and their, their the challenges that they they present. You don't have you you don't have to become this perfectly secure person to have a fulfilling relationship. Shit, I haven't. That's not even close to where I am, and I still experience tremendous fulfillment. But I'm aware of my vulnerabilities. I'm aware that I can have I can feel suffocated very easily. That I can feel. Um, you know, overwhelmed. I can also feel, I can also fear abandonment sometimes. So when that's present, I'm very mindful of, you know, communicating those things in a way that's not blaming, that's not attacking, that's not shaming. Again, not perfect. Brian knows I don't do this, you know, perfectly all the time, not even close, but I always come back to the repair. I always can come back to like, oh my gosh, I did that badly. Or if Brian sets a boundary, I'm, I'm always very willing to go back to that, to that place. And so if you're somebody that's anxious and you're in a relationship with someone that has avoided patterns and they don't have awareness about it, you're going to be constantly triggered in feeling abandoned. But if you guys create agreements in your relationship where, um, you know, let's say your partner needs some transition time after they get home for work, they can't get into connection right away with you. If you guys create some kind of arrangement where maybe they give you a nice long hug, but they go take some time for themselves, but they come back to connection with you, even if that's uncomfortable for them. But that's important. You have to kind of find the middle ground. Like whereas somebody with more anxious patterns, they have to be willing to trust in relationship. They have to be willing to recognize that, you know, even if my partner is not available, I trust they're going to come back. And that does mean sometimes you have to create agreements so that their brain has consistency that creates safety for them. 
You know, what's so beautiful about what you're sharing. It's really lighting me up actually, because I, I, prior to this conversation, I was coming in with the myth or the belief that in some, uh, somehow or another, what was important and necessary is actually to move towards a secure attachment. Like that was the goal, right? But what I'm really hearing uh, from you is just, it's, it, that's not really the goal. The goal is to really get back to that word attuned attuned to actually what is happening, what, what I'm dealing with, what my partners are dealing with, is dealing with, and then get attuned to one another's experience. And that, that is actually the goal that leads to the fulfillment, not the secure attachment, that the belief that some secure attachment was going to give you the solution, that that's not at all what's necessary. Exactly. And there's this concept of earned secure attachment, which a lot of research shows that it takes about four years to create. But I've been working with people for, I mean, 15 years in this, in this, with this map. And even people that have secure attachment developed in that earned way, they still have little glimmers of a fear of, you know, being abandoned or this, but they're just so familiar with it. And they've done that. They've taken the action steps needed to be in relationships with people that are not going to be constantly triggering them, right? So while the triggers live in us, we can choose people that can help be part of our healing or continue the re-traumatization of our, our childhood wounds. Well, I, I was smiling as you were introducing this and kind of laughing to myself because a few, a few just images popped into my head. I, I remember, um, Sylvia, the, do you remember when I went to Ireland by myself? <laughs> I do. For I went for like I went for five weeks. I told you I was going for four weeks. And I remember um it was five weeks because of travel time, but I let it just stay at four weeks because that I knew that that sounded better to a more um relational person. And my my avoidant need to just get away and be by myself was like, oh, let me stretch this out long as I can. And I remember uh, I mean, we'd been together by this time before we were, I, think, I don't know if we were married yet. We were engaged. Maybe we'd been together about four years or so. But anyway, I remember, I, you know, going to West Ireland, one of my favorite places in this remote part of the country in this, this beautiful, beautiful valley in the, amongst these, these very stunning, almost moon-like mountains. It's called the Burren, this area. And, you know, we would rent a house there, um, a little cottage and, uh, it was just like a little place of heaven for me. But anyway, I remember going by myself and, uh, I remember taking a walk, a hike into the hills one day. And I remember here I am standing in these hills, you know, an ocean and a continent away from you all by myself, just like I wanted. And I'm like, okay, I'm in the hills that I run to when relationship gets too much. And I'm kind of like just looking around, kind of like, okay, here we are. Okay, now, you know, kind of boring. Now what? I mean, it's lovely and beautiful. And it's interesting because the, the burren is quite barren, meaning there's no trees, or there's very few trees. There's not, there's not a lot of plant life. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty sparse landscape, which is, again, I think, the, the avoidant tendency that, that, that it's like the belief that being on that barren landscape is better than being in, in the midst of the chaos of life. But I just remember that moment and thinking, yeah, you know, it, it's nice to touch this place from time to time, but I can't live here. There's no life here. You know, the, the, my, 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 my relationship isn't here. My wife isn't here. My, all of the, the, just the, 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 the roller coaster ride of a daily life in partnership with you and with the world, not just you, but with life itself, not here. So I just, I'm just chuckling at that memory. And, and also you speak to opposite, like opposites attracting, right? The two, they're, they're wounded almost in opposite ways, the anxious and the avoidant and how same, we see it so much like, oh, good. Give me, give me, give me. I want that. Look at all that life over there. Here I am over in my avoidant masculine, uh, we won't use that word, but my tund the tund my tundra, my icy cold frozen tundra of avoidance, right? <laughs> Seeing all this life over there and that, that, that animated, activated person 
yeah, gimme. But then when I get it, ah, get it away. And vice versa, of course, right? And so, I don't know. I just think this is such a rich and, and, and vital conversation to explore. It's it's massive, you know? And, and, you know, one of the things that I think is also another draw to one another is that people that have more anxious patterns are really, they are, they do tend to be more relational. They, they're also used to kind of having to go outside of them, leaving their own sense of self. Because think about a child that is not getting the consistent attunement and present. They're like, wait a minute, I have to leave my sense of self to come to get it. Whether it's like crying a lot or, you know, as an adult, we find different ways to do that, like through the punishment, through the passive aggressiveness. Um, and they have that developed sense of relationship, but they really want to feel the ability to come home to self. They see the person with the more avoidant tendencies. Like I remember looking, I was like, oh my God, like Brian is just so like, he's just such a self-sufficient person. I was like in awe about that because I, you know, I tend to have more codependent patterns and I'm constantly hypervigilant managing other people's experiences. And so I really wanted more of that. I wanted that. I wanted to learn that. And you've helped me so much to be more boundary in a healthy way. We can have like almost like porous boundaries where we need, I needed to really develop firmer boundaries to protect myself. And I think for you, it was the opposite. You worked on really loosening some of your boundaries and leaning more into relationship, right? What about you, Tate? Is any, well, is any I, that resonate What you? I'm really just present to inside this conversation is the medicine that's available to us when we know what what's happening for us, what's happening to our partner. And and there's a there's a magnetism for with with purpose. Like there's there's something clearly available inside of these two magnetized attachment styles to come together and and you're speaking about boundaries right now. Brian's given the analogy of the burn, yeah. um, right? Aaron and, burn. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think that one of the, the tendencies could be that people who are in this, this magnetized relationship can just have the belief, well, let me just get out of it, not knowing that there's, and that may be, right, there's different relationships and there may be different dynamics at play where that is the healthiest thing for that particular relationship. And yet... What well, what's likely to happen is we're going to be a magnet in the world for that thing that we need for our healing. And what, what you're speaking to is that there is medicine if there's a pathway, a particular pathway that's taken through the attachment styles that that begins with awareness. Absolutely. And and I guess what I what 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 I you know, the the depths of this is just so interesting because I want to know what other medicine is available. What 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 do these two magnetized poles coming together, attachment styles coming together, what what do they need to be doing to lean into the medicine that's available? Mm, fabulous question. And I think you also spoke to a really important piece that, you know, everyone exists on a spectrum. There's somebody that might have really intense anxious patterns. And if they're partnered with someone, excuse me, if you're with, if you're somebody that has a strong anxious patterns and you're partnered with someone that has really strong avoidant patterns, the gap might be too big in some situations, but there's nobody can de decide for us what we're willing or able to kind of to, to, to figure out. And just because we can tolerate something doesn't mean that we should have to. Right. I think there's that piece. A lot of times I work with clients and they're like, well, I attracted this, so I must be that mirror for it. Well, it's like, well, you probably just have a really high tolerance for that because you experienced it in your family system. So the thing to look out for is, is this relationship going to be a space for secure functioning patterns, which is a, which is a term that Dr. Stan Taken um, coined. And by that, I mean, so if I have more anxious attachment patterns, the medicine that I should always be looking for in relationship is, is there going to be consistency, enough consistency here? And is this person going to be available and responsive enough of the time? I don't want to feel like I'm constantly chasing this person who has avoidant patterns and like constantly having to leave my sense of self again. And that requires creating agreements and creating rituals so that you're not just waiting for connection to happen. You know that you and your partner have a text agreement in the morning. They're going to text you or you guys are going to have some hug exchange. So your nervous system will be like, Oh, consistency, healing my childhood attachment patterns. 
And for someone with more avoidant patterns, the, the medicine will likely be, and this is what I encourage my clients to look for. I'm very directive about this because when I know their wound, it's very easy for me to kind of see what, what will create healing. And so for someone with more anxious uh, avoidant patterns, their healing is going to oftentimes look like being in a relationship with someone that's very warm, very engaging. And curious. So it doesn't surprise me at all one bit that Brian chose you, Tate, as his bestie. You know, somebody warm, engaging, and curious to help Brian come out of his solo self, right? Yeah, but both y'all, warm, both engaging, and curious. Bo both of you. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, Sylvia, like I, I think our relationship is really a, a living testimony of, of how do, how these two different patterns or two, two patterns that might, otherwise war with each other can can lean in and navigate these things. I mean, you and I have come up with all kinds of tiny little strategies around like when, you know, you allowing me, you supporting me to go get my alone time in the tundra, you know, to, to do that is so helpful. And not even just once a year, but but when I when you know that I need it, you know, I think just the other night you said, uh, why don't you go take, I can see you need some alone time. Go take an hour. Let's re let's reconvene in an hour at 8.30, whatever. And it's like, oh, thank you. Thank God. You know, my nervousism goes off. Oh, thank God. That's really nice. And of course, on the other side, you know, when I'll go on these trips or I'll go somewhere or even into my retreat into my own body, I know that, okay, make sure you're checking in with Sylvie. Make sure you're either, you know, connecting by phone once a day, at least whatever our agreement is, right? Or make sure that when you come back in an hour, you're with her, right? You're, you're not just coming back the same, you know, stoic, checked out, withdrawn guy. So, um, exactly. you know, that, that being yes. you, you, so 100%, you, you taught me so much about being relational in a, in a real grounded, practical, everyday way. And I feel like I got to really explore my inner self and I feel like I I don't know something about coming in relationship with you and you had developed this internal world so beautifully I I feel like when we came together it was like I came into full color like I got to really and it wasn't even like I don't it's so hard to even put into words sometimes but and I think you've said this Tate like something about Brian's presence it just like brings like a sense of colorful nuance that it just like it, it helped me tune into that part of myself which is what I've been yearning for because I was so fixated on others that your calmness and your your ability to give me space also and to know that you are still going to be there was was really the medicine that I needed I wonder is that I wonder because again I'm just thinking too of just some of the challenges people that we've we work with and that listen to this podcast are dealing with and I'm I'm thinking of, um, you know, in that, like the gifts, like every, every, every of each of these attachment tendencies, they have gifts to offer. Also, there are gifts here. They're not just like, if you're avoiding, that's a bad thing and you need to fix that. Or if you're anxious, that's a bad thing and you need to fix that. There are gifts here, right? Like I think in, in the, in the anxiety of, of, of the, of the anxious mindset, there is a, there is a care about relationship that often in the avoided mindset is lacking. You know, a lacking of care. I mean, you know, silly again, you're, you're constantly, you know, when I type messages to people, especially typewritten messages, Sylvie, if she sees them, she always gets in there. She's like, no, no, no. Let's, let's add a little fluff. Let's add a little, little love to this. Let's put a little, let's be a little more relational in your opening. You know, <laughs> she, and, it, and it's funny when, when I write, when I help her write her messages, I do the opposite, uh, the opposite. I'm like, babe, let's not over care for this person. Right, you're going a little too far about caring about their experience. Let's let let's let them be an adult and have their own ex have their own big boy or big girl experience. It's okay if their feelings are a little hurt, right? You don't have to. So it's it's it is interesting, you know, how the these 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 can dance with each other. Absolutely. So what what do you see as some of the gifts of each of those uh, styles or uh, tendencies, Sylvie? You know, I think that, you know, it's what Brian is pointing to that um, there are gifts that just need more more balancing, I think, um, because I think if they get they kind of get stuck in 
that in itself, it can, we, we're looking at how to create more wholeness ultimately, right? Wholeness, but also how to be connected in nourishing ways. So for someone that's more anxious, yes, their ability to be relational, they tend to be really expressive and um, able to really articulate their feelings. That's beautiful. But we need to bring that into balance. For example, if somebody's on a first date and they have a lot of anxious tendencies, sometimes they want to overshare because they're having anxiety. So if they can bring regulation and awareness, that gift of expression is profound if they can do it in a way that's um, appropriate to the relationship stage that they're with they're in with a person. Same with someone that's more avoidant. You know, their ability to be self-sufficient and to take care of themselves and, you know, talk about resiliency. I mean, Brian, you're one of the most resilient people I know. That's fantastic when that is paired with the ability to also reach out for support to be able to say, hey, I need, I really need a hug right now. I'm feeling dysregulated. So there's that, that dance between um, in that independence and interdependence between relationship. And it's a lifelong journey for all of us. And it's going to change and be shaped by so many factors. Um, but really, I think to, to bring balance into these gifts is where we will really be able to experience healing the most. It's so helpful. You know, one of, I, I was kind of sharing the, one of the mistakes that I was thinking in my mind around this attachment, these attachment styles and tendencies is to that, that the mistake that I would have made is tried to, my job is to move towards secure attachment as, as the goal here. What are some other common mistakes that you, you see inside of this space? The, yeah, that's, that's, that's really a great thing to think about. Oftentimes when I'm working with clients, I try to help them immediately with that concept of your vulnerabilities are going to be with you for your whole life. You know, there you all of us have two to three vulnerabilities that are part of us. And think about it. If you imagine knowing somebody that you love and they just don't have any vulnerabilities, they're just like, I don't know, it feels like kind of a robotic person to me that just doesn't feel human. It doesn't feel right. Like, like, what texture does a person have if they don't have anything that's like hurt them in their life? If they've never had a milestone that's that gosh, that's like ripped their heart open and 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 allowed them to walk through the through the pain and the experience of that to 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 build resilience through that experience, but they still have remnants of that. We don't want somebody to be in a dysregulated state. So if someone's really suffering, a lot of you know people that have anxious patterns or avoidant patterns or fearful avoidant patterns, you know, they might need professional support to work on emotional regulation, to work on how to create safety in relationships. But the mistakes are expecting perfection from ourselves or that we need to be in some kind of perfect, secure state to have healthy relationships. We don't need that. The other mistake is not creating agreements and being direct about what you particularly need for healing. So I learned early on in my relationships before that when I don't hear from a partner and it's four o'clock, five o'clock in the day, my nervous system is activated as shh, a lot. And when I met Brian and I first started dating, I knew that I needed consistency and I needed like some kind of predictability for my nervous system. And I asked him, like, would you be willing, you know, to do a just even if it's a simple text or some kind of a check in in the mornings? And he was on board, you know, and. I was very grateful for that. And we don't necessarily, we didn't continue doing that for all of our eight, you know, nine years together, but it's, it's adapted and he's always been willing to find some version of that um, and, and, and to be collaborative. You know, I think oftentimes we think we need to create the secure attachment ourselves. And the mistake is that this happens in relationship. You got to be honest about your vulnerabilities with people and see if they're going to hold your vulnerabilities with tenderness and care. And if they're not, sorry, this is where this is where I'm not compassionate. I'm like, that, that person does not need to be in your life because they're not going to support you. That's profound. Uh, that, uh, uh, yeah. Well, well, I want to clarify, too, that when Sylvie made those requests of me, I, I wasn't always enthusiastic about it in my yes. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, that's easy. I'll just do that. I'll just do that thing that I would never do for anyone else. And I've never done before in my life. And it's so uncomfortable. And I don't understand why we have to do it, but yeah, like, no, there was, there was my own, but the key was that again, 
I was committed to leaning into the challenges, leaning into the relationship, taking on my own discomfort and doing my best not to, to fault you for the discomfort that I was feeling just because I was leaning, I was, you know, we're working on creating a new relational pattern that works for us both rather than just me or just you. And so I, I just want to normalize that it's okay that, that, that it's uncomfortable at times to. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's going, it's inevitable, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an, it's actually it's actually the the discomfort that brings us together in ways that then leads to the healing that we're all longing for inside a relationship. It's the it's only through the discomfort because if we just did what was comfortable, it would lead us to go back to old patterns which don't actually solve or cure the the pain, the heartbreak, the trauma that came to bring it on us. So, you know, I really, I, but well, the, the part that really stood out to me about what you shared, Sylvie, is having clear boundaries that if you're with somebody that is not going to have care for the other person's experience and they're only willing to to do things that solve or or tend to their concerns then th th having the clear boundary that this is not going to be a relationship that's worth the both parties diving into at the level that's necessary in order for you to have a beautiful relationship sorry you don't have compassion for that and i really think that that's a powerful message i think that's a really important message because we we are we work with men often you work with men and women often that are in relationships that are that are doing, we had this conversation recently about if you're with a partner that is not interested in growth and development, what should you do about that? And, and you being clear that, that there's, there's, there is a course of action to take and what that is, is, is really profound and powerful and important for people to hear. It is important because it's easy to get caught up in the in the staying connected. And I've been I've been so guilty of that of staying in relationships where again I would get stuck in the anxious patterning and, and overfunction and compensate. But there is there's in Vienna Ferrion who wrote this quote, um, you know, for some of us the the healing is in the staying, and for some of us the healing is in the leaving. Mm. That's profound. It's profound. Profound. And profound. it's only up to us to do that. But we we got to know our family of origin and attachment woundings to be able to recognize that from an integrated place and to be able to be direct and clear enough with what is important to us in a way that's also reciprocal and not just only focused on my needs, my, my, my. Because that's what happens with the insecure patterning also um, is that we can get very self focus because we want to protect ourselves. We're not relation. We're not relating in a relational way. And then we miss the opportunity to also, and, and to check in with ourselves to say, well, wow, did I express my boundaries and needs in a way that was sensitive and kind? Was I blaming? Was I harsh? And this, this takes time and this takes a lot of practice. So for people that are listening to this, like really give yourself permission to, 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 to give yourself like years to learn how to relate in this way and to practice with your friends, to practice with your friends. And, you know, before we, you know, start to uh, wind down, it was really important that I highlight the beautiful, secure attachment that I've been so lucky to witness in your friendship, Brian and Tate. I mean, you guys have this, this way of relating to one another that is, it feels very effortless to watch, but you guys embody Talk about attunement. Talk about presence. Talk about the ability to, to, to reach out to one another when you need support. Talk about the ability to be close, but also give each other space. I mean, it's, it's so rare to, for, for me to witness that, and it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Maybe it's, it's, it's a, I tell you, it's one of the privileges of my life that, that I get, that my wife, you, gets to see this extraordinary friendship that I have with this man, you know, and, and that Tate and I have cultivated over the years. And I'll tell you what, what I, for a man, if you, I'm almost, I'm not speechless. I have the words are here, but it's, it's more like I'm in awe because what we talk about in our, like in elevate your relationship, like we're working with these men, we're so often talking one of, one of our core modules, create safety and trust. Tate and I have spent decades a, li a lifetime a lifetime 
creating safety and trust with each other, you know, and, and we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> Fact. <laughs> it's not like we were intentionally, oh, let's create safety and trust for each other. Of course not. <laughs> just the ways our, our friendship evolved and the things we've been through and just the, the our chemistry, I think as well. And, and, uh, you know, uh, just, you, you know, who, who we're committed to being as, as, as men, um, we've, we've, we've created immense safety and trust such that, you know, we, it's like, we can get through, uh, we both know, I don't want to speak for you, Tate, but you know, we, we can get through anything together. You know, we, we even said at the beginning of starting the, our business together that our friendship must come first. And if the business ever gets in the way of our friendship, we end that business. 100%. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I've so appreciated the word Sylvie, um, cause I'm not even sure that I would have had the words to clarify it as a secure attachment. You know, I just, that's, that's absolutely what it is. But I, 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 even though we're having a conversation about, about attachment to, to offer those words to me, for me to be able to have a label on it, to know what, what it is, it's, it's healing for me to have it labeled for me and gives me a window of what I'm, what I'm trying to do with the most important people in my life. Um, and, and given those variables of attunement and presence and all, all of the things that you just like, that was, that was a lesson in and of itself for me to know what are the essential skills that I need to be bringing in to have secure attachment with the people that I love the most. So, so thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I want, I want to say one last thing, uh, Sylvie, also about our, our journey together, um, because I, I, I shared this with you not long ago, right? That um, I would say it probably took me about seven years to fully trust in our relationship, not trust in you as a person. I trusted in you. I learned to trust in you as a person a long, 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 long time ago. I mean, I knew pretty quickly. Even the way you broke up with me four months in, I was like, wow, she's really trustable. She's like, I didn't use those words, but I was like, wow, she's really kind. Like, she's never going to, she's like, this, you know, this is a woman that I can really just trust to be kind. Fuck, that's amazing, right? I've known that a long time. But trust in relationship. And, and, and I, I think, again, it's testimony to we've spent the first five, six, seven years of our time together working on all these little parts of it, you know, the coming up with the little agreements, learning, learning to attune to each other. You know, I had a lot of work learning to attune to your needs and sensitivities, right? We'd go to, we'd go to parties at the beginning of our relationship. I, I wanted to be the last one to leave. You wanted to be the first one to leave. Man, did we have some conflict around that? And it took us some time. Now it's almost the opposite. I don't know if you'd want to, you, you, but I, I'm kind of don't even want to go anymore. I don't know about that. I just took a three hour nap at your last birthday party in the middle of it. So I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, but we spent a lot of time working on these, these little nuances. And I, I, you and I, in the last what, two or three years, we have been through some shit together. We have been through some challenges that, that I think destroy your average couple, you know, maybe they recover, maybe they don't, but it, it, it really wrecks couples. Some of the things you and I've been through and not between us, but just circumstantially right around us. And, and I think it is, is testimony to, to how you and I have leaned into trying to figure out and dance with each other's stuff and our own that, you know, for, for these few years, I feel like I, you know, Again, I don't want to speak for you, my love, but I feel like, and I should check in with you. That's key number one. Check in with your partner. Don't assume you know what they are thinking or feeling or believing. But for the sake of brevity, I feel like we're in a really good flow. You know, I think we're doing really great as a couple and always things to to to, to deepen in, to, to grow at, to, to you know, he, little, little fine tinkerings here and there, but, you know, just a... What, what a journey it's been, babe. And I'm grateful for you. I, I, yeah, sorry. I don't want to cut in on that. Sorry, Sylvie. Huh. You ain't talking hey, to me. You of all people are always allowed to cut in between you. You ain't talking to me. 
Well, I, I, I just, the thing that's really standing out, uh, out about this part of the conversation is that both of you are actually speaking into this idea that it is going to take a long time. And that's at the beginning, once a couple decides that, hey, let's do this thing called life together, that plan for it to take years and years and years. And that's okay, so long as both people are committed to staying in the work together and not making the other person responsible solely for their side of the street. So, you know, as, as somebody who, who has had the privilege of watching your love grow, right? Like Brian, Brian wrote a book called Choose Your Every Day or Lever. And in large ways, people came to know Brian's work out of the struggles of his work. And that book hadn't even really been written yet to, to, to actually prove that if you do the hard work, you can have one of the most amazing relationships that I've had the privilege of seeing, like the gift of what, you know, having my kids be able to watch the two of you love each other. I want my daughter to see that as an example of, you know, many people grow up and they don't have examples of loving, kind, beautiful purpose-filled relationships that are, that are doing the work that you're doing, but both of you are leaving breadcrumbs, right? Success leaves clues, the clues about what it takes. And it takes years. It takes years. And, and, you know, Sylvie, one of the things that I'm always just so worried about in doing a podcast like this is that people will, can think, oh, well, I listened to the podcast and that's enough. Now all I have to do is go do it. But there's a, there is a deeper level of this that's often necessary. That's why you coach people, right? So help give some discernment for the people that are listening that, that this should, you know, who are the people that this should be just shelf help for, that they're going to go on to the next podcast or the next thing, and they're going to leave this conversation behind. And who are the people that should be leaning in to go deeper into this conversation, into a coaching experience, into just into a deeper level here? How do you distinguish between the people that it's shelf help is fine and a deeper conversation could be transformational? Yeah, I mean, I think it is one of those things that we, you know, there's, we're in the information era, information age era, right? Where there's, we have access to so much information and podcasts and, and social media posts, and it's endless. It never has been so much available at our fingertips. And there is, if you're somebody that has had some level of done, you know, done some work on yourself already, maybe you worked with a therapist, maybe you worked with a coach, and this is refining some of what you've already learned and you've been practicing in your relationship as you've already seen, seen a lot of positive results, great. Then you're, you know, you're, you're experiencing that in your relationship. So that's the biggest clue, right? But if you are noticing yourself, you're reading a lot, you're, you're listening to a lot of things, but you're, you know, you're still struggling to apply what you're learning to relation towards relationships, then working with someone is essential. I mean, we need a safe person to practice with and create that secure bond. That's why therapy is so powerful. Coaching is so powerful because you're, you're collaboratively creating that safety and there's agreements and boundaries already inherent in place. There's an ethical code that's existing. And then you have to kind of engage in that relationship to see if it's one that is fulfilling and nourishing for you. And I would even go as far as to say, you know, a lot of times when we're looking for someone to work with, try to work with someone who has the, um, who's embodying some of the qualities you're looking for. So I remember when I was looking for a therapist to work with, and I, I really wanted someone that was more brainy, that was more cognitive based, that really helped my contain my really intense emotional world. Somebody that might have a difficulty feeling or con feeling connected to their emotions might, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, would really benefit from working with someone that's maybe emotionally focused that can really help them do more embodied work. So recognizing what your unique challenges are and find someone that can support you to better understand yourself. And the relationship itself is known to be the most powerful aspect of healing and finding someone that you really connect with and that you can build a safe relationship with. So, so if someone wants to work with you and learn more about you, like how can they, how can they look into that? 
So I'm currently working with people on basically exactly what we're talking about. Um, I work with a lot of clients in the dating domain that are kind of in between relationships. They just got out of a breakup and they're wanting to really identify what qualities they really want to identify and work on um, seeking out and being more discerning in their process um, and, and really helping people understand their attachment patterns so that they can create more fulfilling relationships, better boundaries, better communication to be able to articulate their need, their boundaries, and so they can communicate it in ways that is kind and reciprocal. And you can find my uh, coaching page on my website. I'm sure you'll, you know, you'll link it. We'll put it in the show notes. A, yeah. Yeah. You can book a consultation to see if we would be a good fit. I currently have three month and six month packages, including boxer support, which is brand new, which I'm really excited to really be able to stay more connected in between sessions and, and just take people more deeper, more deeper, more deep, deep, deeper. The most depth, the, the most deepest, depth. the most depthest. The depthestest. Sylvia, you're amazing. Thank yes, you. you are, babe. Thank you. What a, what a blessing. What an incredible, Truly. gifted, beautiful, incredible Indeed. person you are. Thank mm -hmm. you for being with us. And, Thanks, and we'll, we'll have to do some more roundtables with us. And uh, there's so many, there's so many things that we can explore. It's, you know, we're just, we're just all up to interesting things. And so, and, uh, and I want to bring Elsa into that roundtable because talk about secure attachment. What your wife has created for me, El the Tate, and the 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 ability to attune and be curious and be responsive and available. I mean, her and I could not talk for months, and I have so much safety in that relationship, and that is really rare for me so i would love for the four of us to also let's do it i love that add. idea that'll be fun i'm in is, i'm in extraordinary. i love you also. Oh. i love you you're my girl right. thank you so much sylvie love you thank see you, you. Soon. love you both see you soon like five seconds as soon as we turn this off right there. Right there. Thank you.